Well, first, let me say that it's such a great honor to be here. Um, I've been to many exhibitions that people have to pay buy a ticket to see, but this is the first time I'm presenting work or giving a speech that be, you know, it's in a, in a ticket event. So I feel really flattered that you're willing to do that. Um, and uh, thank you, Jonathan, for your introduction. Uh, I think there's so many people I'd like to thank, um, but that would take up too much time. I uh, do want to say some uh, words of appreciation for um, the institution that made the work possible. Um, I I'm going to talk about two programs, <clears throat> two series of works that, um, that took me to Tibet and Japan. Um, and it's, it's through uh, these uh, sources of funding that I was able to make the trip. Um, it includes uh, Ephraimson Contemporary Fellowship, uh, Asian Cultural Council grant uh, in New York, and many, many generous support from the IU New Frontier grant, the Kahi um, Research Travel grant. Uh, we even have a uh, in a national affairs office that provides language learning grant that enable me to learn Japanese before I took the trip. So um, just want to thank these people who make the, the work possible. Uh, it's, I, I think it's only fitting that I start with where I left off here in Chicago. In 2006, um, the last time I made a pre formal presentation about my work in Chicago, um, was at the Society of Photographic um, Education Conference. Uh, and the work is titled Blood Work. And it has to do with my daughter's illness. Uh, she was diagnosed when she's five months old. Um, and, uh, must be louder? Okay, could you please raise the volume a little bit? Um, And uh, for the, in, in the first few months, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, difficult, we're facing a really difficult situation. And the last thing I want to do, I can think I can do, is to make art. Um, she was diagnosed in February, but in summer, uh, the only thing I can think about is, is to make art. Um, and uh, I used her body in a composite to kind of simulate the medical situation that, uh, that we're facing and uh, become sort of the anchor of our recovery. Um, in 2006, she was, uh, the leukemia was in remission. Uh, she was four, uh, she was almost four, uh, and I made that presentation in, um, in Chicago. Uh, but then, uh, soon after that, uh, the, her leukemia relapsed, and, uh, and she passed away the year after in 2007. I was, uh, as you can imagine, it was, it was, uh, I was really lost. Um, nobody teach you how to cope with these kind of situation at school. Um, and I, two weeks, within two weeks of that, uh, of her passing, I went back to Taiwan and I, in a, in a bookstore, in the CD booth, listening booth, uh, I was listening to this sort of, uh, this Tibet, Tibetan singing, um, in, in that CD booth. And it was a, a female voice and the voice was so serene and comforting, I started crying. Uh, and I sat there for half an hour. Uh, for the first time, I felt like I was comforted or cradled by, um, by something that, you know, that really, that I could view as a, as a, as a source of support. And, uh, and one thing after another, I started a lot of encounter with uh, Tibetan Buddhism. In Bloomington, there is a Tibetan Cultural Center um, that was created by uh, Dalai Lama's uh, older brother, Jigme Norbu. And uh, I started going there and volunteering for work uh, at the time. In 2007, they built a new building, brought in a Tibetan monk who specialized in painting, uh, and I was following him, sort of making decorations. It becomes a very meditative work. And I talked about her um, the Tibetan song that I listened to and the vision I have, the distant snow cap, the, um, the, the windy, vast landscape, um, and, and this, this mountain that I had in my vision. And he said, you have to look at this mountain called Kailash. Um, Kailash is an a Indian word. Um, it, it turns out that this mountain was worshipped by four religions. Uh, it's a sacred mountain for the Tibetans, uh, but it's also worshipped by Hinduism, Jainism, um, and Bonism, which is a native uh, Tibetan religion. And uh, it's, it's 
about 900 miles west of Lhasa. Um, and uh, it's not particularly high. It's about 70, over about 68,000 uh, meters, uh, which compared to Everest, which is about 89,000 meters, it's, it's not particularly high. But because of the location, it's, it's really visible. I mean, it's among the other mountains. It, it's uh, it's uh, sort of its long-standing structure, pyramid-like shape, uh, makes it such a sort of a sacred symbol of the region. Um, and this is uh, a mural painting in one of the biggest temple monastery in Lhasa. And you can see that um, Mount Kailash was, along with Mount Everest, uh, being worshipped in Tibetan religion for a long time. And it's also um, being incorporated into the, 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 the culture, it's, it's contemporary culture. And this is, um, a lot of people come to take the pilgrimage, uh, not just Tibetans. This is a, a, a Russian group uh, who came to the, um, the mountain um, for, that, for, the, for the circumambulation pilgrimage. And this is a bottle of water um, symbol that was posted on, the, on a hotel mirror. And uh, it's on tea house, it's, it's everywhere, you can ma imagine. It may not be a famous symbol or, or well-known place in the Western world, but in, in Tibet and in India, this is definitely uh, the place to go. So what do, the, what do people do in, the, in a pilgrimage? Um, they perform a ritual called Kora. And it's a, Kora is a, a, form, a, a form of pilgrimage that, you know, conducted by uh, meditating and walking around a sacred site. It could be a stupa, it could be a monastery, it could be a city of Lhasa, it could be, a, uh, it could be a, the entire Tibet. Um, and uh, the, the, the most uh, sacred kora is probably the kora around Kailash. Um, I should go down. And this is uh, a festival, I mean, also the, 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 the most important time or most sacred time to do Korra is around the, the, uh, the Tibetan lunar calendar, April, which is usually around June. And people come during this festival called Sagadawa, which is the Buddha's birthday, um, to conduct a various amount of various rituals and walking around this uh, um, flagpole, and they, which they took down and then replaced the, the, um, the prayer flags and then uh, re erect um, and uh, the festivity is really infectious. Uh, the energy um, and, uh, you know, the, the sound and the fume uh, of the place is, is really striking. Uh, here you see people throwing uh, barley flour in the air uh, and chanting. It was, uh, it was a really dreamlike situation. And after they conduct the ceremony, they just sort of march off to... Um, uh, to, to do the Korah around the sacred mountain and uh, the distance is about 50 kilometers uh, between the altitude of uh, 15 and 18,000 feet. So I decided that this is really, and it's, it's, it's something I'm destined to do. So uh, it took me about two years of planning uh, to acquire uh, the resource and funding to make the trip and I started in Lhasa and then made my way toward e uh, west. And you see a detour down there that's uh, a, a trip to the Mount um, Everest, which I uh, videotaped in the base camp for a couple of days. And then we veer back to the main road and then head west. And you can see uh, Mount Kailash is right there on the west. And then I return on the northern route and make literally another Korah. Uh, in the western, western Tibet. Now, an impression about the place. The air is really thin and crisp. And um, we're, we're looking at from Tarqing, which is sort of uh, uh, the launching uh, uh, town for the Kora on the China or Tibet uh, Indian border. Uh, and the mountain there is about 120 kilometers away. It, it feels like it's right in front of you. And this is a photograph that I, I took on, on my way down from um, the high pass uh, during the Quora. And uh, the, from here, I, I saw our tent. I was really excited. I, I, we're almost there. We, we made it. And it, it turns out it took us another two hours to, to get there. 
Um, so it was really, I mean, the, the distance is, um, is misleading. I mean, the, the visibility is really strange. And the light quality is just um, amazing. This, is, this photograph was taken uh, on a lake uh, just next to the Sacred Mountain. Uh, and it's, the lake itself is considered one of the largest freshwater lake and high altitude freshwater lake um, in the world. And it's, a, it's considered a sacred lake as well, so people perform kora around that lake. And this is a shot at night uh, from a monastery uh, that was up in the hill. Uh, of course, I'll see a lot of nomads, uh, a lot of herds. Uh, typically, uh, a well-to-do family could have up to 100 sheep um, and uh, with no labels. Uh, they, they figure out a way to kind of you know, know wh whose herds are whose, uh, and they may have less than a dozen yaks. Uh, yaks are a lot more expensive and more difficult to upkeep. And toward the west of uh, western Tibet, uh, the, air, I mean, the, 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 uh, the climate has become a lot more arid. Uh, and desert-like, and this is a photograph taken around Kuga Kingdom, which disappeared uh, around the 17th century. Uh, looking around, it just, it's hard to imagine how, um, you know, it's such a beautiful culture sustained by, you know, sort of this desert-like climate. And then after a while, um, there's just so much scenery and, um, you know, it was become repetitive. And so, oh, a lot, another big mountain, another big lake. Uh, and then just, you know, uh, we become really tired after a while, actually, just be exhausted by the beauty of the place. Um, and oftentimes, we feel like we're walking, going back in time. Um, this is uh, inside the temple. It was pitch dark. You see the, the, um, uh, the yak butter lamp. Um, that people come, uh, come to contribute. Um, and uh, this is another place inside a temple. Um, and you see these walls, a the structure, they're hundreds of years old, and uh, people sort of perform the ritual uh, as if it's, you know, just centuries from, from centuries ago. Um, the, the sense of history uh, and uh, the time, you know, time journey is, is, is really amazing. And of course, there's that sound of their chanting that um, um, sort of leaves a strong impression. And you can't really talk about Tibet um, or the image of Tibet without talking about these prayer flags. They're actually translated directly to wind horses um, and with the idea that they uh, printed a Buddhist scripture on the flags and when the wind blows, it carries the prayer with them. And, um, um, and sometimes you see actual horses with wings on these flags. And they like to hang them in high passes. Tibetans worship the high passes. And um, they actually perform a certain chanting when they drive across or walk across these high passes. And this one was taken on the trail of the Kailash Kora. Uh, so if that pilgrimage, the trail, is sacred around that sacred mountain, this is the most sacred place on that trail. So you see an ocean of flags up there, which you're going you're gonna to find in a video, and I'm going to show you in just a little bit. Um, what makes it the most place? Because of the high pass, because of the, the mountain pass. Um, the Vans, they, they just geographically, they see the, the mountain pass a, a, a special place for energy and deity, so the, sort of like the deity lives there. Um, and we came most of the, um, most, for the most part. Um, we were there for, uh, I mean, uh, we left Lhasa um, and then returned in, in three weeks. So for half, more than half of the time, we were on uh, the road and in tents. Uh, this one is by the lake, um, the, the sacred lake I was just talking about. And this one was on the trail um, back from the Kora. Um, and this one was uh, near the, 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 the high pass uh, during the Kora. And these are yaks that I hire, actually. And speaking of the yaks, I wanted to talk about my, speak, you know, introduce my crew. I have a, a driver uh, from the left to right, the driver. I mean, actually, the cook. Uh, he's a cook. 
Uh, and then I had the, the two drivers, my guide and my assistant, uh, who was my student from Indiana University. Uh, and we had two trucks, one for the, um, for the cargo, for all of our supplies, the generator, the power generator, the tents and everything. The other one is for, uh, for the ride. And it's uh, pretty bumpy for the most part. Uh, and then we took, I mean, we, it, it's literally, we can't do it without their, their help. And we hired three porters uh, when we were, uh, uh, we were up in the mountain. And using this really special camera that uh, when assembled together, uh, the total weight of the camera is 26 pounds. Uh, so it's really heavy, but it creates this sort of ultra, ultra high de uh, resolution that I'm, uh, that's really necessary for a work, uh, which, uh, again, I'm going to mention that in just a little bit. Um, and then uh, on the Quora, we see pilgrims from time to time. Um, uh, most people, Tibetans can walk that trail in one day. It's pretty incredible. Um, they, they left before dawn and go home for dinner. Uh, it's, uh, the, the, when, when, when you see them, they don't seem to walk that fast, but you know, they just disappear, I mean, before you notice. Um, and, but these people are not going to be fast. They, they prostrate the entire, entire way. So it would take them about um, a month to complete it. So they would prostrate all body on the floor, on the ground, and then get up, walk a body's length, and then get down and do that repeatedly uh, for the entire trip. And they don't bring any supplies. Uh, they live on people's offering uh, on the road. And this is a, a shot of a, uh, uh, in a, in a tent when we came down from the Quora. This is sort of a hotel uh, rest stop. Um, there used to be 13, because of the popularity or the importance of the Quora, and people, so many people come um, to do the pilgrimage, there used to be 13 monasteries around this trail, and they're all destroyed during the Cultural Re Revolution. Uh, three of them remain, it was rebuilt uh, today, but it's not nearly enough to, to accommodate uh, the traffic. So we end up sharing uh, food in, in tents like this. And we have a lot of curious Tibetan friends looking at my assistant. Um, and uh, I, I, another sort of vivid memory uh, of, of in Tibet is that I, I was for some reason, I think for obvious reason, I'm always looking for children. Um, and I remember just sort of, you know, walking by children and just stare at them. And it's, I can't move my eyes away from it for some reason. And this is 2011. Uh, and my daughter passed away in 2007. So if you calculate the time, believing reincarnation, um, I was, was probably looking for a four-year-old at that time. Um, so I was looking around for kids, um, just sort of you know, their gaze and, and imagine their lives there. Um, it, it's sort of an improbable connection that I probably would never, you know, fulfill. Um, so going back to the work, uh, Quora is in such a high resolution that it requires a special way to show. Uh, the vertical resolution is about 30, uh, 3,200 pixels. Um, so it's, it's about twice two and a half to three times higher than the high, you know, the regular high definition. So I use eight, I mean, I use six different projectors to stitch a, uh, a seamlessly uh, integrated image uh, in a gallery situation. And this is one of the biggest projection I made in a museum in Taipei. Uh, so it's about 22 feet by nine feet tall. And I'm potentially making another one um, next year in, a, in another biennial. So let me just show you the footage real quick. I'm going to show you about a five-minute excerpt from the 14-minute um, footage. Can we raise the volume a little bit?
it looks like a video and a, a kind of a, has a cinematic feel, I, I do hope that when you're imagining the experience of this piece, uh, you don't associate it with, with film. And uh, instead, an experience, um, a first person experience, per se. Uh, because in the gallery situation, I think the viewing circumstances are very different from sort of sitting down in the audience, um, uh, waiting for something to happen. Uh, I think in the gallery, people are actually, the, the engagement is different. Uh, you walk around, uh, and because of the resolution, it doesn't break down. Uh, you can still see details in the, in the image. And as I was just testing the piece in, in a school, in a lab, um, I, I remember one of the first in, uh, co comments I'm always getting is that, oh, there's a dog right there. And, oh, that's, that, that, that's a bird. And there, people are pointing to places and objects and things that are uh, you know, in, a, in a awareness or a perception that it's there. So I think it's sort of an immersion um, that I think it's important for, for this body of work. And the sound is composed by two composers, uh, Aaron Travers and Melody Uftus. And uh, Aaron is an assistant professor at our, um, the School of Music um, Composition Department. And uh, Melody was a PhD student, and since then she had graduated. Uh, Aaron was sort of uh, in charge of the string acoustic instruments, and Mer Melody composed the e electronic music. Uh, with a combination of the sound field recording that I made uh, during the trip. A lot of people ask me, you know, did you hire these pilgrims to do the prostration? Um, the answer is no. I mean, uh, everything was on, um, uh, unstaged. And uh, uh, another reason for that is we're actually, we don't have a lot of uh, access to discussion with local people. One is the language barrier. Uh, the other one is we're almost in, you know, we're not, uh, we're, all, we're always monitored. Um, we can't go to a temple without uh, bringing our guide. Uh, so in a way, we're sort of constantly monitored. But the idea of the circle is, uh, is not new, and in a way, the connection is uncanny. Um, I ran away from home when I was 17. My mother was uh, desperate, and she went to the psychic uh, to ask, you know, where, where, where I, you know, sort of, what am I going to do, uh, where I'm going to be, and so on and so forth. And he said, uh, the psychic said, don't worry, you know, his life is an island. He would always uh, return to the beginning point, so returning this to this circle. So uh, there's many points in my life I just thought that was, uh, was a, it's a metaphor that is uh, very, very true. This is the only point in the film that we get to see Mount Kailash. Uh, it's the one between the two mountains in the front. And this is the high pass. Uh, it's called Dromala. Um, in addition to how sacred this place is, uh, it's also a place that's associated with death. Um, People leave their clothing, their picture, photographs. Um, there, to uh, to kind of symbolize that you know, uh, sort of part of part of them is, is has passed away. Sort of you know, you, and you experience reborn, rebirth uh, from that point on. And some sometimes people bring the clothing of their relatives there uh, for the same purpose. And uh, for me, uh, I, uh, I took, uh, I used a, a photograph that I always kept in my wallet and stitched it onto one of those flags and just let the flag go. Um, so it was a really 
uh, symbolic and important moment for the entire trip. Um, so, so I finished the Quora, and a lot of people asked me, you know, well, how do you feel? Um, I was uh, embarrassed to say that, uh, you know, I was so preoccupied with the filming that I didn't really have time to think about. Um, but the act of producing the work and showing the work, seen in different stages of finishedness, uh, allows me to relive that experience. So, in a way, this Quora sort of just continued um, as I move on with the work in my life. And with that, I'd like to bring you to a, another work, which is the title of the work Behind the Wave. And we can't talk about Behind the Wave be, be, without talking about the improbable waves. And you can see that this is a, a poster or the uh, announcement card of my show in Taipei, Improbable Waves, uh, in 2011. And if you look at the date, the opening date is March 12th. Uh, and this is earlier that year when I did the, the Quora pilgrimage. Uh, something significant happened in this world uh, in March 11th, 2011. Um, in Japan, uh, at 2.46 p.m., there's a magnitude 9.0 earthquake that happened off the east coast of Japan, uh, created one of the biggest tsunami in modern history. Um, I was supposed to fly home on March 10th. The flight was delayed to the next day, so I flew on March 11th. I was supposed to detour, I'm not sorry, making my transfer in Tokyo and, and land in Tokyo at 3 o'clock. Um, and then that flight got delayed. I was rerouted to San Francisco and then back directly to Taipei and barely just missed the tsunami. And the next day, I was showing this work. And for myself and for the audience in the gallery, the, the connection to uh, the tragedy was, was just uncanny. Um, and uh, it, in addition to that, my sister lives in Tokyo. Um, and we're trying to reach him. And my colleague, uh, there's a famous photographer, James Nakagawa, who had his first solo show in Taipei uh, at the same time. Uh, and his mother lives in, also lives in Tokyo. So we have this sort of tsunami conference almost on a daily basis, trying to talk about uh, sort of bringing each other updates on our relative situation and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, uh, it feels really immediate. The experience is very close to us in a way. Um, and the, the following year, um, a friend of ours, Mariko Takeuchi, a photo critic, uh, art historian, visited IU, and he did, she did a series of work uh, about the non-journalistic um, way of of responding to tsunami um, in, in Japan by a series of photographers. Um, I, for a long time, I've, I've had doubt with uh, sort of with, with photojournalism. Uh, I was trained as a journalist, actually. My undergrad degree is in journalism, and I worked for two years as a journalist. Uh, but I, I know how we try to edit our view uh, or collect our footage uh, and look for the pictures, the moment, to, to capture the essence of the disaster. Uh, and it's a very narrow one. Um, and for the longest time, I, I, thought, I thought of it this as a sort of a exploited, abusive situation. So, uh, I, you know, because of all the connections, I just feel compelled to, uh, to do something about it. Because, um, I, I, you know, I, I couldn't bring myself to watch the news. Um, and uh, there are sometimes I, I get glimpse of children's shoes on the beach, it's just, it's really unbearable. Um, but I decided that I, I want to do something about this and, and share my vision, um, not my vision, uh, share a different vision um, that I perhaps could, could bring to this dialogue. So I made a, a, a blog called Behind the Waves, and, um, and this is sort of, um, this is one of the first image, it's a, it's a Google Earth map of the radiation uh, level. So you can see that in the area there's a lot of red lights, um, but there's also that spike that is around the Fukushima nuclear number one power plant. 
uh, that, that's, that's still an ongoing crisis. Uh, and during my trip, I walked by myself for about a month um, with, uh, um, with, the, with three different cameras, one attached to my chest, the other one that I uh, mounted on the Steadicam, and I shared with the local people, I invite local people to walk with me and to take footage, which I'm going to process um, and then uh, perhaps produce in a way that's similar to Quora. And I, have, I took a series of photos with still, um, uh, with still as well. Uh, and I blocked the entire trip. Um, in the beginning, I'm thinking, I, I, perhaps I just going to, you know, it becomes a diary or a, a, a recording of people who helped me, the names, um, and the weather, the mileage, and so on and so forth. So very utilitarian. But it, it turns out that I can't stop writing about their story. Um, in the beginning, I, I just didn't realize that, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if I have the language capacity to have a real conversation with the Japanese people. Um, but it, it turns out that it really comes out naturally, um, and I was able to get uh, a lot of uh, incredible stories from them. Um, and I learned a lot on the trip. Uh, so I walked this tr uh, a stretch. Um, Sort of in, in this, you can, you can see that the, the, this is the observed height of the, the wave. You can see that from Miyako to Soma. Uh, it's, you know, you, you're, you're, you're looking at 30 feet high waves. And with such a velocity that they actually march inland, so uh, the destruction is unimaginable. It, when, when the waves are traveling in the water, it could go as fast as 800 kilometers an hour, and it's supersonic. Uh, and on the surface, it, it kind of slows down, but it's still, you know, it's a, it's a huge amount of force. And I, I used to look at, I mean, uh, by the beach, I was on a train station. I, I saw a, a, a stainless uh, pole that was on the, on the ground, sort of like a straw, and it's, a, it's pretty incredible. Um, and here you can kind of see that, uh, you know, you could definitely see, sense the height of the wave. So on the, f on the fifth floor, you can see the window is still intact, but everything down was destroyed. So here I'm going to show you a little bit of footage. Uh, this is an excerpt of something I made actually during the trip. Uh, a, a collection of footage from day one to day five. May I and take within an hour, when I, you know, after I started the work, which is when I started from a, a cemetery, I saw a diver. You saw a diver earlier, and I was about 25 kilometers away from the Fukushima plant. The last thing I expect to see is people in the water. Uh, but they surf. You know, uh, Minami Soma was a famous surfing spot in Japan, but I just didn't realize that people are still actively doing that uh, right now. And I asked one of the divers to, I mean surfers, to, to film for me, and I had a conversation with her, and I asked her about, you know, if she's concerned about uh, the danger, uh, radiation, the, the, the hazards, and she drew a big Hi. question mark on the ground, saying the water gives him peace, and gives her peace. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, there's so many things that's uncertain uh, in this world. Uh, uh, that part, she did not really <laughs> uh, This is the first <laughs> farmhouse, B&B <laughs> farmhouse, <laughs> that I stayed in. Um, and I wish I stayed in places like that. In I ended up spending maybe half an hour of time in hotels, but some, sometimes in the B&B places, which I enjoy a lot more because I get to talk to these people. And it rained, it snowed. Um, incredibly, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, it's a very peaceful, um, you know, there's a lot of emotional moments, um, but being on the ground, working with a different sense of purpose, is something that is so fulfilling for myself. Um, you know, here we walk between train stations, subway stations, from here to the parking garage, 
uh, when you hike, it's for leisure. But you know, when we're thinking about walking, okay, I'm supposed to walk from here to the next town. It's a really, it's a real means of transportation. Something sort of more. Bring out some raw, raw, a raw quality about our connection to the ground that I never experienced before. And uh, I always offer food, help, support. Uh, the guy in the blue jacket volunteered to walk with me for a day. Uh, took me five to five to um, So uh, I think the, the, the idea of recording this video is you know, my, my humble attempt is to show that um, or is to make people aware of that you know, the northeast Japan is not a point, it's not a dot on the map. It's a real place. And I'm going to upload all of these images unedited to the web. I'm going to show you my video site, uh, which I already have about 31 posts. Each of is about an hour long. Uh, and I want to upload the entire footage. Uh, and this is not sort of a video piece that you're supposed to watch from beginning to end. Um, but hopefully by the existence of that volume that it creates a sort of space-time continuum uh, about a place that you can't just you know put a finger on. It's very complicated with the people uh, with a lot of unique stories um, that I hope to um, you know, not necessarily share them one by one, but to again you know, bring out that awareness. This is Sendai Airport. Um, you probably have seen a lot of. Uh, Iconic footage, I mean, image about the Sydney Airport, you know, that airport in the water like an island. Uh, it's all restored now. So we're still, I think, in the West, uh, or even people in Tokyo, when I, when I talk to um, local people, they, they just kind of make fun of people in Tokyo saying they're paranoid. Um, and, uh, but you know we have such a fixated image of the sort of the disaster zone of the place that uh, although some are true, but I think on the ground it's it's um, a little bit complicated. Um, I'm going to read you a couple of passages that I you know on my blog. Um, this is in the first day. Uh, it surprises me that I have become emotional as the journey begins. Despite all my planning, now the reality hits me like a rock. I wake up crying for an hour, as if Vivian just left us yesterday. The memory of her is sealed in a box. I'm always guarded, too, uh, too scared to open it. I guess she decided to come out today, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm soaked with her image. Am I doing this for you? I ask her or myself. So, you know, with all the time that I get to spend with myself and my own thoughts, um, this is probably the, the, the trip, you know, as, as a personal experience, is, is the, the only time that I get to really think about sort of my memory of her, uh, the treatment, um, and, and try to find connections um, with people. And, uh, and knowing that I'm not the only one. Um, and I started in March, uh, just uh, uh, February 28th. This is March 11th. So I was, I was midway through my walk. And, uh, and March 11th is the third year anniversary of the tsunami. Um, and there are cer ceremonies, uh, memorial uh, events, I mean, television events uh, that's happening everywhere in Japan. And this is one of the most, uh, uh, one of the, the most iconic place. Um, the, the building was a, a, um, a Christ management center, and it's stripped, stripped to its core. Um, and I wrote in my blog, I closed palms in front of my forehead at the altar. Tears came to my eyes. It was not all sadness. I gained a sense of peacefulness when I pray for the others. By sharing their grief, the burden of each individual is lessened. The whole trip has been like a group therapy. Um, 
And then, of course, in that place, there, uh, there's sort of this, this satellite network, um, television uh, news coverage everywhere. And uh, there's a, a drone actually hovering above us, um, and there's footage on the TV. And I, and I look at that, and I just can't help wondering, you know, they're, they're, they're so well packaged, it's beautiful actually, um, that I, you know, have my own doubts about. I watched the news reports on the trip. I cannot help feeling a bit iffy about some of them. The images are too perfect and well packaged, an oversimplification of reality. The practice leads us to recognize the world by these landmarks and monuments. On the ground, the banality of the small road seems more true to me. Um, and in that footage, you saw these two guys sort of uh, playing with the remote airplane. And, uh, and I asked them to film. Uh, the guy on the left uh, seemed very eager to talk to me, and uh, I, can't, I couldn't quite understand him. Um, and I wrote, I finally figured out that his mother was sept, swept away alone with the house just south of here. He's the first person I met whose family was infected. He did not look sad and was smiling the whole time. I shouldn't assume anything. He probably don't want me to feel bad. It's a discretion I understand by heart. So, um, I'm going to show you more footage from the road. This is uh, all from my chest recording. Uh, again, they're unedited uh, on the web. You could, you know, read the blog and try to find the events, the happenings on the video on the side. Uh, and I, you know, on one of the days, I, I oh, sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? I found these kids by the road okay. 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 In, a, in a graveyard. Okay. Yeah. Such a striking. Striking oh, contrast between their clothing colors and the gray and black uh, headstone. Uh, and I, I approached first. them and I, first. you know, just wanted to talk to them and they ended up being very curious about my camera. They ended up filming for me. Uh, I just thought it's a really, really amazing sort of contrast between their, not just their clothing, but also life and death. Uh, and then after a while, their grandpa came out, not happy, and talking to them. Then I, I, I gave him his my, my standard. Tried to describe with my limited Japanese, but I also had this cheat sheet that they could get to read and then kind of walk up with a smile. Hey. Uh, Japan in general is a very safe place to travel. The infrastructure is utterly broken. It's really hard to find a place to stay. But overall, I, I feel safe. Uh, whenever I need help talking to people, they can see um, But going through tunnels is a different story. There's no sidewalk. And um, there are a lot of different, a lot of tunnels. Uh, this one is really long. 23, 2300 meters. It's about a mile and a half. Um, and I spotted this tunnel on my iPhone. I was like, uh, this is going to be interesting. And I fantasize the driver will stop, drive, stop me right before the tunnel. It's too dangerous. Let me give you a run. That didn't happen. So I had to walk through. Uh, and you see me at the midpoint. Uh, finally, to the looting that I can make. Very filled with car fumes and dusts. And it's, uh, it's actually pretty incredible. And over here, I am walking through. I try to hug the shore line as much as I can, and sometimes running into these sort of impassable situations. Um, and uh, and then I see the scab is a great. I have to you know, I turn around, and I turn around. I saw this old guy kind of coming close. And the area, the area is closed. I'm not supposed to be there. And then, and then even more surprised to see uh, another gentleman. Coming out. And, uh, I couldn't understand him at all. Uh, I managed to have him write down his name. Uh, he's probably 75 years old. Um, uh, and he did film for me too. 
uh, I caught, this is toward the end of the trip, um, I caught this sort of one of the biggest um, blizzard in the northeast in recent history. Uh, and the road was not cleared. Um, I mean, at least the sidewalk is not clear. So I end up having to walk with uh, buses and trucks. It's even more treacherous than, than the tunnel. Um, it was nonetheless uh, beautiful. Um, I, in, in the, in the, on the road, I'm, I always enjoy the challenge. You know, the, the more difficult it is, the more I felt like um, I'm putting myself in the, in the situation that I can reflect more. So, not about the comfort. Um, and this is toward the end, you see the, the, my destination, Miyako, uh, on a sign, and I become really emotional. And I almost, I mean, I'm whispering my head to my son and my daughter, Daddy uh, Davis. I was confused, actually. You know, I said, is this it? Um, I'm here, so what now? Um, and then the road got my attention, um, and I, I kept on walking. Um, so when I, as I wrapped up my trip, um, I have 35 people filming for me. Uh, I haven't had a chance to process their footage. Uh, I really appreciate their generosity, you know, not just them, but also people who supported my trip on the road, and I think the best way to return their favor is to share their story, and that's what I'm doing now. So, thank you very much. Yeah, we have a time for a brief question and answer. Just raise your hands and we'll come to you. All right, I've got a first question right here. In the uh, filming of the Cora, it seemed to me that the camera was always focused on a center point and that the edges, top, bottom, and side to side, were blurred. I'm assuming that was intentional. But what was the spiritual intent behind that mm -hmm. technique? Right. Uh, the, so the, the question about the sort of uh, tilt and shift effect, um, it, it's something that you find in uh, we were sort of trained to recognize the image as microscopic, or not microscopic, um, as uh, micro, you know, something that's closer to you. Uh, so there, there are two different reasons. One is the resolution of the, the camera is just too high. Uh, you see everything. And, and also, I'm walking. So there's a lot of movement, you know, first-person perspective movement that, that makes the scene look so busy that I think it's anti-spiritual. Um, it, it just become too, too busy, in a way. So I try to reduce that by blurring parts of the image. And another, uh, another intention is to, pl to play with scale. Um, we don't really have a good, you know, sort of uh, resolution to, to show that here, but, you know, when it's, when it's, when it's really all the detail is visible, uh, I think there's a, a, another, again, the, the, the kind of close-up feel to it that you imagine that being small. Uh, I always try to play with scale in my work. I try to make big things look small, small things look big, and I think it's within that sort of ambiguous zone that uh, our brain is charged to actually actively participate in the interpretation of the space, and I think that's a more active way of viewing, um, and I hope to engage the audience that way. Uh I wondered two pieces of information. The first one is, uh, will you be exhibiting or showing your work anywhere anytime soon? Um, yes, the, the show is in, uh, the work is at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas. Uh, and for those of you who doesn't know about that show, it's called State of the Art. Uh, it's uh, it's, it's uh, conducted by the director at the uh, Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, it's a beautiful, gorgeous museum built by the, the Walt, Walton family, mm. the Walmart here. Uh, they have really one of the most amazing work there. Mm. And it's a beautiful museum that's worth a visit. So I have a piece that's showing there uh, right now. I hope to bring it to Chicago. So yeah, so we need to get somebody to yeah. bring it here. Right? Yeah, so. 
And Please my, make some phone calls. Let me know. <laughs> my other question is, um, clearly both of these trips really touched you deeply. Do you think, and you mentioned Buddhism, do you think that um, your, the spirit, your spiritual depth has um, really grown quite a bit from either Cora or um, the Waves trip? Uh, I think the work itself is, is part of the agent of growth. Um, but it's not the only one. I think my own family tragedy in and of itself drove that growth and along with uh, my inclination toward Buddhism. And it makes sort of, uh, you know, when I, when I struggle with a, a lot of sort of uh, the trivial life situation, it just makes it, uh, you know, those challenges that you think are challenges, just, you know, reflecting on these trips, it, it just makes it easier for me to overcome those experiences. And Jonathan mentioned that I'm the chair of the, uh, the, chair of the department now, and, and I, I get that a lot. So uh, I, I need sort of, you know, just thinking about the work, coming to this, you know, to present a work like, like this and revisit the experience of, you know, of, of the production, I think was, uh, it's, a, it's a really nice break uh, from that job, and it, it's something that helps tremendously. I wondered, uh, uh, along with the kind of the, the Buddhism, hearing the chanting, which make, made you feel so calm, have you moved in the direction, in addition to the Korra, toward that religion? Um, you mean my dedicating for, for, for Buddhism? Yeah, I'm, it was when my daughter was first diagnosed, I remember driving her to Indianapolis for her first treatment, and I was, uh, I just felt sick. I, I felt sick, and I, I didn't know what to do. Uh, I was grown up, growing up, I was an a atheist. Um, I, you know, the, my first instinct is like, I should pray, but I didn't know to whom. Um, I was just, I feel, I don't have the tool to deal with the situation. Um, so after my daughter passed away, I just have this sort of urge to see, um, you know, it calms me when, when I see Buddhist um, sculptures, um, scu you know, sort of images of Buddha and uh, the religious chanting. It, it's, it's comforting, actually. So uh, it, it's one of the situations that, you know, when, when, you know, when I as a patient in life, um, um, understanding that I'm sick, I, 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 I know where the treatments are. And only when I'm sick, I get to know that these medicines are there for me. So, yeah, I mean, I, I continue uh, my praying. And I'm not a very good practitioner, I mean, but, but I'm a true believer. Yeah. I've been very moved by your personal journey when I saw that, that you were going to be speaking about Fukushima today, I have had such a, a strong reaction here about what has happened in Japan and the political it, response. So I'm having trouble connecting your beautiful healing and the people that you talked about who were in that water that is so radio active and, and so devastating and the Japanese government has not yet, to my understanding, which of course is limited here, um, I, I'm having trouble putting the political and the personal story together. Perhaps you can tell me a little bit more about it's, the you, other side? That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, how, how can we talk about I mean, Tibet without mentioning its political situation? So it, it's the same dilemma that I'm facing. Um, but, but I think on the ground, uh, I don't know how much I can translate that feel to the audience. Uh, on the ground, my, my, I, I gain clarity in a way that is, again, hard to describe. Um, it was about, 
you know, I, I have this blog, right? So I have a project description that's very, you know, almost a little bit too academic, you know, behind the wave is this and that project, you know, almost borrowing the line from my grant application to describe the project, which I thought was a, you know, was not, not a very good thing. Um, so about a week into the trip, I took the, you know, behind the wave is a video art project. I took the video art out. I just, I no longer felt that I was working on an art project. It, it was a real pilgrimage. Um, and, uh, and I don't even like the word project. You know, it's just the thing that I did. Um, so, so I think, you know, the, the purpose is, is very simple. Um, I'm curious and I want to find the depth that's beyond the sort of oversimplified reporting, you know, what, what's going on. And, and I think it's people's lives that I'm more interested in than, than the political situation. And not that they're not important, but because I think the, we've just seen a lot more reporting on those parts, you know, the struggle, uh, the, the, the government's position, um, and, uh, and our, you know, the, we as human beings, our attitude toward energy, you know, that's part of the picture too. Um, so I, I ran into a lot of different, I think I, I, I walked by three different power plants, uh, two coal ones, and I, was, I got as close as to five kilometers within the Fukushima power plant, uh, which requires special permission. Um, so, you know, I just want to bring these facts out, you know, for people and for us to reflect on, um, not necessarily, you know, there's, there's no conclusion to this kind of things, you know. I think, uh, for me, I think my goal is to try to recognize things in its complexity as opposed to try to find a single angle to interpret. So uh, that's sort of my take on it. Mm -hmm. So now, do you have to worry? Do you have to be concerned? Do you take any tests? Do you, are you noticing your own bodily whatever um, as a result of the time? Well, thanks for your concern. The, the, one of the first equipment, piece of equipment I bought was a Geiger counter. <laughs> it, it's, it is concerning, uh, trust me. And, uh, but then I, I did a few tests. The highest radiation level I detected was in an airplane across the Pacific Ocean. It was a hundred times higher than the ground level. You know, that single flight, that single flight might have been, you know, I've accumulated enough exposure. That's, that's you know, my entire months of exposure on the ground. So things are, that are in the air is not, does not concern me as much. You know, it's a very scientific interpretation on my part, but just the, 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 you know, the comparison is, is, you know, is striking. Uh, but what's in the water, I don't know. Um, but I'm there just for a short term. I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have a lot of cons I mean, worries, um, per se. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much Thank for you attending. So much.